Okay, hold on to your breakfast. We're starting off strong with fasika, a delicious dish of preserved mullet fish that was eaten during the spring festival, Sharm al Hasim. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. Sounds great. Till you get to the bit where they leave it to ferment and rot in the sun for weeks before serving. I take what I said back. That does sound bad. Hmm. So what did fasika taste like? You wonder. Well, imagine a flavour explosion of saltiness, tanginess, and a hint of, well, teenagers socked. Some described it as an acquired taste, while other people just absolutely rave about it. Both those descriptions sound like polite ways to say. It tastes like ass, but it's culturally significant. Plus, it's fun to try it on tourists to see if they'll eat it. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Not something I'd be willing to try, I have to say. It was usually paired with onions. Yes, they had onions, and a squeeze of lemon to, you know, cut through the funk. Frankly, I'd have paired it with a bin and a takeout pizza, but that's just me. The ancient Egyptians also thought it was medicinal, because of course everything's medicinal, and would boost health and vitality. Not sure how, seeing as the Egyptian Ministry of Health has had to put out frequent warnings about potentially poisoning yourself if you make it incorrectly. Fermented fish isn't just a weird ancient Egyptian thing, though. Many cultures have got fish-based sauces or dishes that smell like the inside of a hockey player's jockstrap. Think Asian fish sauce. And even the British Worcestershire sauce? That's made with anchovies. Now, try it on a bacon butty or mix it in with your cheese on toast. You will thank me. The ancient Romans had a sauce made of fermented fish guts too. They called this garum. One of my favourite YouTubers, Tasting History with Max Miller, he's done a brilliant video on this stinky sauce, and I'm going to link to it below. Max's channel is amazing if you love food, history, and eating food while watching a rather lovely young man tell you about the history of it all. Wow. So we've got plenty of evidence that the ancient Egyptians had quite a decent diet, actually. They ate beef, they drank beer, certainly liked a bit of bread. Gotta get those carbs in. But they also liked a bit of ostrich burger from time to time. There's cave paintings of the Egyptians hunting this massive bird, dating all the way back to 4000 BC. And even King Tut had an ostrich feather fan in his tomb, and that showed him an ostrich hunt, so it's clearly a big thing. The ancient Egyptians would also have eaten the eggs and used the feathers and eggshells as decorations and in their rituals. In fact, ostrich feathers had a special significance to followers of the goddess Mart, who covered stuff like truth, justice and your basic human decency. Her ostrich feather was the one that your heart was weighed against when you died, to see if you'd been a good person or a bit of a twat. We might do a video on that, so let us know in the comments if you want to see that. Described as lean and flavourful, the texture reminiscent of sort of beef or venison, you can still get ostrich meat today. So if you fancy getting a bit Cleopatra at your next barbecue, break out the ostrich burgers. Oh, and don't forget to weigh the heart of the person who brought potato salad with raisins in it against the ostrich feather. Don't think I need to tell you which way that one's gonna go. Spoiler alert, they ain't getting into heaven because that is all levels of wrong. The ancient Egyptians had plenty of protein options. They ate beef, mutton, pork, game birds, ducks, and as you now know, ostriches. So with all these big delicious animals around, seems a bit weird that poor Mrs. Tiki Winkle got a place on the menu. I bet it's like foie gras or caviar. Tastes like crap, but if you have it at dinner, then everyone knows you're fancy. Uh, I don't know what's fancy about picking spikes at your tongue after your hedgehog nuggets, but okay. The hedgehog would have been wrapped in clay and then baked, so when the clay was removed, it would take the spines out at the same time. Mmm, handy. Although I bet they probably had a tool. You know how you get, like, asparagus dishes and avocado peelers? I bet somebody had a hedgehog peeler. We can't tell you what they taste like, because our research drew a bit of a blank. All we got was definitely not like chicken. Nobody is owning up to eating hedgehog. If you've tried it, please let us know in the comments what, what do you think it tasted like. Stop it. Get some help. There's carvings of hedgehogs going back about 4,000 years. The ancient Egyptians even decorated their boats with hedgehog heads. But hedgehog wasn't just on the menu. It was a symbol for rebirth, as it has a kind of reverse hibernation and, again, was used as a medicine. Isn't everything. So, for example, a recipe dated 1500 BC provides a remedy to promote regrowth of hair loss. It describes burning the hair of a hedgehog in oil or fat and anointing your head for four days with it. Mmm. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's burning hedgehog spines. Extra weird fact, in Britain in the 1980s, 
There was a company selling hedgehog flavoured crisps. They actually got into trouble and had to change their ad to make it clear that it didn't actually contain any hedgehog because people expected it to contain hedgehog. Why you'd want that, I don't know, but they did. And no, despite being a British lass of a certain age, I do not remember eating these crisps. So I can't tell you what they taste like, although for some reason I want to say like smoky bacon kind of flavour. It was like a meat, I'm sure it was like a meaty thing. So if hunting a teeny weeny little hedge piggy or a giant manic chicken wasn't manly enough for you, the ancient Egyptian pharaohs could go looking for something a little bit more challenging. Hippo was another favourite for a good old animal whacking session. Hippos were seen as destructive bastards who would have your arm off in a blink and had really negative connections to the gods as agents of chaos because nothing says chaos like a hippo. Nice. They were aligned with the god Seth, the original bad guy. We might do a video on, on him, so please let us know in the comments if you want to see that. Pharaohs liked to hunt them because it symbolised their protective duty over the land and was a bit like, look at me killing this symbol of evil and turning it into steaks. Aren't I such a good king? Go me. What would you do without me? They weren't just a good source of meat though. Hippos were also valuable for their skin and their massive teeth because humans love to look at an animal and go, hmm, your teeth would make really good cups. But what does hippo taste like? Well, according to one source we found, it's still eaten in places like Zambia, and it tastes like a richer version of beef. So here's a recipe for those that would like to try it. Take one evil hippo, make sure he's really evil, cut him into bite-sized pieces. This should take about five weeks. Set over a medium heat, simmer in wine-enriched stock for at least three months, serve with rice noodles or a metric ton of mashed potato. Hippo bourguignon, anyone? But what about drinks? I'm sure you can guess the top beverage in ancient Egypt. Yep, beer. Only the beer they made wasn't like the fruity IPA or a nice little craft ale that you're probably used to. Their beer was made in vast quantities, was actually not that alcoholic, and was a really important food source. It was cloudy, soupy with loads of bits in. Mmm, drip tray. And you say my protein shakers are nasty? At least they're not fermented. Not according to the one I found on your desk the other week. That thing was about to evolve legs. Beer was so important, it was used as a currency. Workers were allotted over 10 pints a day when building the pyramids at Giza, and beer jars became a standard measurement. So it's not just Americans that refuse to use metric. Yeah, exactly. Don't get me started on the lack of metric. So the British Museum... You know, I don't like you using that curse word. Dirty, robbing, thieving. Yes, I'm aware of your feelings on the British Museum. Can I finish? Go ahead. They did a little experiment using the items that they... Yes? They borrowed and recreated the beer they think would have been brewed about 1500 BC. It used emma wheat, which is a precursor to modern wheat, and some natural yeast. They essentially baked some bread, then stuck it in some water to ferment. Damn! The ancient Egyptians wouldn't have used hops like we do now, but what they might have added is things like roses, pistachio, coriander, and cumin. You know, some craft beer place in San Francisco is now going to bring out a beer that tastes like a Tex-Mex bowl in a rose garden. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? All in all, the experimenters really like the beer they created, so it can't have been that bad. Again, Max over on Tasting History has a brilliant video on ancient beer making that you might be interested in, if beer is your thing. I'll link to it below. He actually makes some beer, tastes it, so, you know, if, if that kind of thing, if ancient craft is your thing, go check it out. So, that'll do it for this week. If you've enjoyed today's video, go ahead and invite the subscribe button to a cookout, but instead of guacamole, give it for Seeker for its hippo chili dog. I'm Obi, you know Tut. Thou shalt not skip leg day. And we've been in Tut's world. See ya!